So shifting to our second C, which is complexity. So this is the overarching list of criteria for all personality disorders, not just borderline. So the first slide that we had is the specific symptom list for borderline personality disorder. This is what defines a personality disorder, or what DSM-4 calls an access to disorder. And again, I do have a reason for putting this up here other than to kill my talk. Um, the first is that you can, again can see the overlap between these criteria and a substance use disorder. Enduring problems with cognition, affectivity, interpersonal function, and impulsivity. Um, most of the personality disorders uh, that we're not going to talk about today have impairment in you know, a couple of those. Patients with borderline personality disorder typically have impairment in all four of those. And patients with severe substance abuse problems uh, have problem, typically have problems in all four of those areas as well. Both disorders are, uh, tend to be, at least the chronic versions of them, uh, tend to be uh, flexible and pervasive across patterns or situations, cause significant distress, and also have a very early onset. But the key defining characteristic, which is bolded as, as letter F, is that a personality disorder, and this is true of borderline personality disorder, can't be better accounted for by the presence of a substance use disorder or any other psychiatric disorder for that reason. And so this was a reason why uh, about um, uh, 10 years or so ago we began a study here where we really tried to tease apart this issue of what's in a substance abuse population, what is real borderline personality disorder versus what's borderline personality disorder that's been sort of induced by uh, a chronic substance abuse disorder. And it turns out, as you can imagine, that that's easier said than done. Differentiating personality traits from the acute states of intoxication and withdrawal are fairly easy for most patients to make a distinction, but you start getting into some of the, the, the longer term behaviors, lifestyles, interpersonal kinds of interactions that people have, or affect kinds of problems that people have as a consequence of a severe addiction, and it becomes very difficult for them to tease out what is related to my personality versus what is related to this chemical that I'm uh, putting in my body every day. And that is compounded by the fact that if you have a, a, a chronic substance use problem, you tend not to be the most reflective individual about what is being caused by your own personality versus what is being caused by the lifestyle and the drug that you're using. And so it has in, impact on if one's introspectiveness, your ability to make uh, dispositional attributions, which is, I mean, is a way of saying, yes, this is my personality versus this is the cocaine that's doing this. And there's uh, impairment in the ability to uh, acknowledge um, uh, problems that one has. So we looked at this in a large sample of uh, a study of Bruce Roundsville's here at Yale of inpatient outpatient substance abusers coming into the addiction treatment program. Uh, had a nice mix of different drugs to abuse, uh, good inclusion of women and uh, non Caucasians. And we had this, certainly from the patient's perspective, very laborious way of diagnosing personality disorders, which was we first went through a structured interview, established that a symptom existed so that we could diagnose them, and then went back literally item by item and tried to make sure that this was a personality disorder symptom that was not better accounted for by the presence of a substance abuse disorder. And so I won't go through all the methods of this, but there were a variety of questions that we asked to try to be able to determine that this was really what we called an independent personality disorder symptom as opposed to one that was secondary to their substance abuse. And this is what we found looking across all the disorders. If you look at the lower right hand corner, the uh, number that's not in parentheses is the overall rate of personality disorders in the sample, which is 70%, and that criteria for one or more. And then in parentheses is the number that was found when you use that conservative diagnostic method of excluding all these possible symptoms. And when you look at the range of the, the disorders, those first three are, are cluster A disorders. You can see almost no impact on the rates of personality disorders by this uh, method. And likewise, over in the right-hand column, the last three are the cluster C disorders. Again, you see very little impact on that. But if you look at, at the cluster B disorders, particularly the two most common, which are antisocial and borderline, you see anywhere between uh, 12 to almost 20% reduction in the prevalence of these disorders. So it really did matter in terms of the diagnostic problems. It turned out it didn't matter an awful lot in terms of treatment-related variables. Um, it, 
didn't seem to be related to a more severe form of substance abuse if you, if you met the criteria with or without the exclusion. But that, that attempt to try to piece apart um, what might be different kinds of ways of, of thinking about borderline patients who have substance abuse problems sort of helps me transition to this idea of, of trying to subtype patients who have substance use disorders, disorders and BPD. And the primary reason that drives that is, is some belief that we have that, that there may be different patient groups that are going to need different types of treatment interventions, depending on what type of BPD patient that they are. Again, what we found with this first attempt to start subtyping was this, this distinction between a substance-induced personality disorder versus a substance-independent personality disorder really didn't seem to uh, uh, matter very much. However, there's really a vast clinical and research literature that, that has really paid a lot of attention to um, subtyping borderline personality disorders across a range of symptom or historical variables. So some, some studies have looked at subtyping borderline patients who have the presence of psychotic features versus those who tend to be more in the neurotic range of things in terms of negative affect. Others have looked at whether or not suicidality and impulsivity are present in patients with borderline personality disorder. Others have looked at those who have a uh, history of childhood sexual abuse or not. Diagnostic criteria, and, and, and here there's, there's kind of sort of a reason for this. I want to put up now two slides, which I'm, I'm going to call prototypic case number one and prototypic case number two, just to get, help you get a sense of, again, the second C, that the complexity of this co-occurring disorder. And here, and, and the only thing that's going to be common between these two slides is, is this last criteria, which is impulsivity, which you will always see in a substance abuse uh, patient who also has BPD. Okay. So this is one way to meet uh, diagnostic criteria for this. And again, uh, those of you who are working in a mental health treatment system, these are going to be symptoms that uh, you will see very frequently um, when you're treating people with BPD in those settings. And if you were confronted with a patient who had these five symptoms and maybe even more, your probably best bet would be to try to get them into a DBT program like what Seth operates over at, at the hospital. In contrast with your prototypic case number two, um, which again has the impulsivity symptoms, but very different symptom constellation here. Uh, I like to sort of think the distinction between case number one and case number two is sort of case number one being a threatening subtype and uh, case number two being a threatened subtype. Uh, so, more uh, emphasis here on abandonment, emptiness, affect instability, identity disturbance, and impulsivity. And if you had a patient who just met these criteria, it'd make you think, would, would DBT be the, the best or only treatment approach that you might send them to? It might be the kind of patient who would be able to move immediately into those later stage DBT techniques that sometimes you can't get to when you're dealing with someone who's kind of suicidal. Uh, uh, patient, um, but it also might be the kind of case that might be better served by one of the other um, emerging models for the disorder, including Dr. Gregory's doc, uh, dynamic deconstructive therapy, or uh, transference-focused psychotherapy, or schema therapy, or something like that. When you look across the symptoms, another way that people really try to understand the subtyping is to first try to identify what is for, for a disorder that is so heterogeneous, 151 ways you can meet the criteria, what is really core to the disorder? And different investigators um, use different labels to essentially talk about the same thing, which is that there seems to be a core, what Robert Kruger would call externalizing psychopathology, as well as internalizing psychopathology, with externalizing being uh, disorders like antisocial personality disorder and substance use, and internalizing being the mood and the anxiety disorders. <laughs> Tom Scotal and others essentially talk about that as either an impulsive aggressive versus an affective instability kind of core problem. And Tim Truel has labeled it somewhat differently in terms of um, kind of normal range of personality traits. So these two core problems tend to be <laughs> what defines borderline personality disorder, whether you call it externalizing, impulsive aggressive, or disinhibition on the one hand, or negative affect or affect dysregulation on the other. 